So would you believe we have here on the bench today a Crossman air pistol designed for the space age? Welcome back to Canuck Air. So why would I call this uh, Space Age? Uh, other Crossmas of the uh, mid-1960s were clearly a bit more adventurous than this in their designs. This just looks like an obviously a police revolver. Well, you kind of have to think back, I think, to the, to make my case anyway, think back to the 1950s. Um, the heroes of the day were test pilots. These were daredevils who were willing to get into a recently designed and thrown together um, aircraft uh, using cutting edge aerospace and engineering and hopefully manufactured well enough to get it off the ground and fly it safely. But if things went wrong, well, hopefully they could get it back on the ground again. And, and if not, well, then they just had to hope that their ejector seat and uh, parachute worked well. It was obviously pretty dangerous work. But by the 1960s, the aerospace world found itself on a full-fledged space race. You couldn't take short test flights right above the atmosphere uh, to see what worked and what didn't anytime you wanted to. You want to solve all your potential problems and be prepared for any emergency or contingency before you set fire to a ton of rocket fuel. The new buzzword was simulation, low-gravity simulation, high g-force simulation, even had fully-fledged space capsules that would never leave the ground that they were used to simulate the entire mission, simulate every problem that might arise in the hope of being well trained for every solution. Other agencies at the time must have noticed all this and um, they might have considered that their training maybe fell short of a full simulation of what might happen on the job. Like police officers who might be called upon to draw their firearm. It's one thing to train uh, by shooting at uh, well-lit bullseye targets hung neatly down a, down a shooting range. But it's quite another to be uh, prepared for coming across an armed robber in a uh, dark warehouse. So what if nerves and adrenaline get in the way of recognizing innocent bystanders? When do you shoot? When don't you shoot? So it seems the American military actually asked Crossman to make a realistic air gun that could be used in training to simulate actual dangerous situations. Presumably this is more for military uh, police training. You don't train the infantry to fight with handguns. If you think handguns are going to win your war, you're, you're fighting the wrong war. Which is why the air pistol that Crossman made is a revolver. This is called the 38 t And it's a CO2 cartridge revolver, a uh, six shot with a six inch barrel. And it's designed to closely mimic the dimensions, weight, and handling of a real 38 caliber police revolver, um, which was a common firearm at the time for, for duty officers. It should even fit in the, in the same holster for those who carried the 6-inch gun. Um, there was a 38 c uh, with a shorter barrel, about 4 inches, a little bit less than that, but it would have mimicked the, the size and weight of a 4-inch barrel revolver. Crossham made the 38 t in three different versions, and the 38C as well. Uh, this is actually a third variant, or th phase three is what Crossman calls it. This one is in 177 caliber, so that was made actually from 1976 to when the gun was phased out in 1983 and replaced by the, uh, the 357 with the break open loading. As I said, this is phase three in, in 177. The phase two one that was before it from 73 to 76 Exactly the same as this, but with a 22 caliber uh, barrel and cylinder. Um, the two and the three versions can be—you can tell them apart because the cylinder here is actually made of plastic, as is the rear sight. Otherwise, everything is pretty much the same. I have here a Phase One gun um, with a 22 caliber cylinder made of metal, and it has a metal rear sight. I picked this up a few days ago and. Uh, I actually have hopes I can get it going again. Um, this one's been uh, monkeyed around with quite a bit. The rear sight is actually broken. The, the rear sight leaf is actually broken out. That no doubt got damaged at some point. The, the loading um, 
mechanism here is missing as well. Shouldn't be too hard to make something that would work for that. The other thing that's kind of unusual is the uh, the barrel does not come to the end of the of the shroud um, like it's supposed to. And I was kind of wondering what was going on there until I realized that oh, you're right. Somebody cut the barrel down, shortened it by eh, it looks like half an inch or so to make the muzzle look a little more 38 caliber revolver like. So I'll probably have to finish off the end of that barrel properly, make sure it's nicely fitted in there. But I think the rest of it, it does want to work. The caulking mechanism is a little bit out of time. Um, as messing around with that, it's getting better. So uh, it just needs a small adjustment and it should be good again. Somebody else obviously painted as well. The cross and mark has been scrubbed off it. Um, there might have been a serial number in here as well. And somebody has refinished it with a matte black paint. Um, and it's a little ugly looking, but uh, yeah, I have some hopes to get that going again. That'd be kind of nice. And uh, this is also another 38T, um, 177, third variant again. Same as this, oddly enough, they looks like they made them with different type of uh, different grips at some point. Um, not sure when they got creative with this. There's no serial number on this one. Don't know why, again, maybe it maybe got scrubbed off, or I don't know. Maybe they didn't have them on at that time. But... Uh, this one looks in, uh, this one apparently worked somewhat recently until it started leaking gas right at the seal. And it uses the same type of seal as in the, the 357 revolvers. So that should be, I've got a couple of extra of those, so I might should be, should be able to fix that. Hopefully they don't all need seals, because I think I've only got two left at the moment. But, uh, yeah, we should get it going again, I think. I right, worry about that later. Now, the gun that, uh... How realistic is this? The gun that this was designed to mimic is the uh, Smith & Wesson K38 Masterpiece. So this is what the gun is closely modeled on, and it's pretty darn close. Um, this obviously is a swing-out cylinder gun, which Crossman couldn't do uh, for their uh, pellet gun. But uh, straight ejection there like that. Um, this is not really a police revolver at all. This is actually a very uh, fine precision target gun. And it's kind of hard to tell at first unless you know all the little tricks to it. But yes, it has target sights on it, which that would snag on a holster if you were going to be, uh, you know, carrying it into, into harm's way. So it also has adjustable sights, which became a popular feature with police departments at the time. And uh, so Smith & Wesson actually made a, a, uh, a slightly different var variation of this gun with a, with a more slender barrel with a different front sight. And I think they did away with this tiny ad adjustment right in here, which is just to uh, adjust over travel on the trigger so it only moves just a tiny bit after it fires. Again, this was a target gun designed at the time when revolvers were still being used in, uh, in serious competition. And uh, it's, it's very nicely balanced. It has a... a a fairly wide rib here, um, and again, based on the police revolver design, but a, a more d refined design. And that's clearly what Crossman were duplicating here with that heavy rib. And the weight is fairly close. Um, it's uh, and obviously it doesn't have wooden grips on it, but uh, yeah, what well, you know, you don't get everything. So let's take a closer look, if we can, at these two uh, 38T revolvers. This is the, the later one in 177, and this is the early one in 22 caliber. They both obviously work in fairly traditional ways, the, uh, what we're used to now anyway. At the time, though, fairly new feature, putting the CO2 cylinder in the gun grip. Crossman had made other earlier revolvers where the CO2 was out front, so this was maybe a little neater solution. Um, You'll notice, perhaps, that this has five screws holding the side plate on. Um, the uh, the later model, the 357, only has two there and the other one for the, for the barrel pivot. So this is uh, definitely a bit more robust construction. Um, let's see if we can learn a bit more when we pull it apart.
Okay, we'll lift the side covers off here. This one, as you see, is missing the uh, the loading the loading piece here. It's a little plastic piece that pushes the pellet into the, the cylinder, which is captive there. Um, this one does not have the is also missing the the spring and ball bearing that provides the detent on the cylinder. So, I'll have to see if we can uh, find a suitable replacement for that. Lift the spring out here. Interesting. The cylinder doesn't come out because you have to remove the uh, the axis pin here for it to to come free. Also the uh, the valve, unlike in the 357 where you can just lift it out and a couple little notches that hold it into the frame, this one is actually screwed in on the side. that holds the, the barrel in place. Ah, oh, there we go. That's why I wouldn't come out. It's kind of rusty. This is the barrel shroud. Fairly heavy casting. And this piece here, I'm just going to need a bit of cleaning up, is what holds the cylinder in place. There's the barrel. Okay. Looks nice and clean, though. This we lift out somehow. Oh yeah, that's in the way, isn't it? Okay, get that out. And this all comes free. This is the plastic uh, cylinder used in the later guns, and also 177 size. Notice that there's a little. Uh, probably helps loading the pellets in. There we go. There's our valve assembly, and unlike the 357, this is this part is actually threaded in pretty tightly. Um, locks down with a copper tube, kind of like plumbing fixtures, except under much higher pressure. Now the other thing that's interesting is you have here a hammer transfer bar. When you pull the trigger, the hammer hits that, which then hits the valve. This gun does not have that. Is it missing? Another piece that's missing? Or is that the way it was made? I have to find that out. Okay, I'll put these aside. This gun also has a little part right here to add tension to the, to the hammer spring. This gun does not have it there. It was never there, so yeah. There's also a pivot point here, which isn't there. Okay, yeah, these do do differ a fair bit. This is your metal cylinder, 22 caliber, which meshes with that surface, which looks pretty much identical to the other valve. They didn't really change anything there, did they? No, that does have a smaller diameter than that. that that's larger. And we don't have any provision for that bar on the back of the trigger. So nope, it didn't have one that has a, a longer valve stem, I guess. No, not really. 
Oh yeah, the hammer's cut differently here, isn't it? This hammer nose here is what comes through and hits that, and this is much, much shorter, so this has to hit the transfer bar before it will fire. That comes forward and hits that. Aha! Okay. Well, I'm going to finish stripping these all down because I'm going to take the finish off uh, this gun at the very least and see about giving it a better paint job. Not sure about what to do with this one. You can see the, uh, the, uh, the rear sight on this one is also has a full length leaf just like a Smith & Wesson revolver that it copies. Whereas this one here is a short stubby one made of plastic. And uh, that I think just slides on out. No, no, it does screw in. So a couple of simplifications on the gun, but not a lot. Not a lot. They're very, very similar. So I got inside the valve of the 177 gun and discovered that the seals were pretty much crumbling on it. So that's part of where the problem was. This is the uh, actual uh, valve seat itself. Those, uh, when the hammer knocks it back, the air can, uh, the gas can get down those two little holes. But yeah, these seals are just going brittle. So I designed a template on my on my computer to see if I could uh, cut it out on my uh, little little desktop router using a urethane here, which the uh, the cutting tool did not like very well at all. I found it very difficult to get uh, the exact shape I needed, but got there in the end, got a seal that would uh, fit in the gun fairly tightly, and uh, well, lo and behold, I was able to get that part of the valve to work, but I had leakages around the copper uh, pipe that connects the, uh, the cylinder assembly to the, to the valve itself. Patched those up as well, gave it a shot, um, but uh, sad to say, uh, all my best efforts came to nothing with this gun. And then the, the 22 caliber gun, which had a, a better valve, was also still leaking on that copper pipe area. Um, there are little gaskets, uh, seals in there, and of course those exact parts aren't available anymore. So, um, wish I could give you good news on this, but uh, I ended up giving up for the moment on this uh, 177 gun and the and the 22, despite all the work I put into them, despite the fancy finish I painted onto them. Um, they look nice, but uh, they don't actually work. The 177 gun, its main problem is, I can seal it up tight as a drum now, it doesn't leak, but I can't get it to fire. The, uh, the gas just won't come out the valve because the hammer's not hitting the valve hard enough. There's something impeding it inside there. When you tighten down the, uh, the CO2 cartridge, something gets slightly warped or bent inside and the, the hammer mechanism's not working. Uh, as I say, I don't have that problem with the 22 caliber version, but, uh, but it just doesn't want to seal up tight anyway, so. But the good news is, I suppose, there is a third gun. Uh, the one that I've had to do hardly any work to it at all, and it works just fine. There we go, tighten it up. I forgot to put in the new seal. Okay, I've got a fresh cylinder loaded in this one, all ready to go, 177 caliber. To start off by using the uh, GECO wad cutters, and I'll try some uh, our, uh, JSB Exact Express just in case they do any differently. They're a slightly heavier pallet, so we'll see what happens. Because I don't know exactly the correct procedure for shooting five shots out of this, I'm not sure where the blank cylinder comes up. I'm sure I could count it out if I wanted to. But uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to shoot six. The trick is to put six pellets on the bench and drop them in, because you can't see what you loaded. You can see where the, uh, the model that replaced this, the, the 357, with its break open, uh, break open loading was uh, probably a better idea. Uh, you can see when the gun is loaded, you can see when it's empty. Um, and of course you can always quickly empty it by just 
breaking it open and dropping the, uh, the, the, uh, the cylinder out. This gun, when the pellets are in it, pretty much the only way you can get them out is by shooting them out. All right, let's see what we can do. I've moved the chronograph a bit closer to the gun. First time I tried this, I ended up with a lot of blank count. So let's see if I get this more evenly here. Didn't get a reading. Nope, not reading. Okay, I'm going to turn some lights off here. No reading. I do not know what's happening. That did it. 400. Three eighty one. I think that might have been empty. All right, so I'll move the chronograph in even closer. Okay, let's load six more and see what we can do. You might think, well, wad cutters, yeah. But actually, Crossman's preferred pellets back in the day were wad cutters, the Super Pels. They did have a fairly heavy front nose on them, though, so that might have been things a little bit easier. Okay, let's see if we can get six across the lights this time. 390. 385. Don't want to speed up my shooting too much, or the temperature, the, the gun will cool down too much and lose pressure. 390. 396. 388. So the last one. 385. That should be empty. Yeah, okay. Let's try it with the, uh, the dome pellets. And the difference might not be so much what they weigh, just as how well they fit. Getting a tight seal as the uh, gas hits it is sometimes more important than what happens down the barrel. There we go, fully loaded. Six more shots. 386. 379, 380, 373, so slightly heavier pellet, slightly slower, makes sense, no reading, okay, I'll shoot one more just to make it even five readings, I think. Where is it? Can't see it. There it is. Okay. So there we go. Five shots with the JSBs, a little bit slower at 379.2 feet per second. But the important thing with this gun is it's how consistent it is. The extreme spreads are quite low, which is not what we saw with the, uh, the Crossman 357. That was its biggest problem, was that its velocities were, you know, you get a low velocity shot every now and again. So I took the one good gun out to the range and uh, 
started out by sighting it in with the uh, inexpensive uh, GECO wad cutters and I found out that it shot pretty much point to point of aim even though it kind of been uh, disassembled and cleaned and lubricated. It's all worked pretty well. This first group here um, wasn't perhaps as good as I could do. I felt I could improve a little bit better. But can't complain too loudly. Uh, 29 millimeter wide by 36 millimeter group, so not so bad at all. Try it again with the same pellet, concentrate a little bit harder on the sights. Got a little bit more vertical stringing on this group, but uh, the width wise was, uh, was improved. It's only uh, 7 millimeters wide by 32 millimeters high on this one. Again, I'm not going to complain too loudly. Not so bad for a, you know, 40 year old air pistol. Then I tried the, um, the JSB Express pellets, the 7.8 grain ones, and they performed quite miserably. I was shocked. Um, I thought they would definitely do better than that. 73 millimeters high, 46 wide, not good. So I switched to the, the slightly lighter 7.3 grain JSBs, and uh, and it just shows how it pays to test different pellets. These did considerably better. Um, I don't feel I was shooting any differently from one target to the other, so I got a 22 by 27 millimeter group here. So what have I learned from these interesting old Crossman revolvers? I definitely have enjoyed my time with them, and I'm not done with them yet. Um, I'm determined to find some more parts to see if I can get that 22 caliber one working at least, and see what I can figure out on that uh, stubborn 177 one that uh, won't release gas down the barrel for some bizarre reason. But I did, uh, I did certainly appreciate how the this design was meant to mimic the uh, the handling and feel of a you know, a uh, police revolver at the time, uh, considerably more so than the 357 models that came after it. Um, obviously the 357s borrowed heavily from this, uh, from what Crossman learned on this, but the 357s are definitely a lot more user friendly in terms of being able to load them, unload them, check if they're loaded or not, that kind of thing. These guns are more difficult to deal with, so I can see why this design faded away, but if you had to choose between them, yeah, this is the better gun by far. Definitely, it just it, this is this is the one you want. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll be back soon with more fun stuff. Consider subscribing.